So if I was the acoustics, I think it's... Did I type this name right? This one. Oh, it's the second one? Yeah, the second one. What do you but mean all the details no, this he's way? He's not doing anything about MRI. Yeah, so actually. Like, okay. Yeah, but so you... Yeah, he's a biostatistician, I know, from the CDSI. Okay. Yeah, but he has an appointment there. Yeah. Okay, and he does something like classification. Yeah, a lot of classification. He's a famous work in the ocean and the... And what was the name of this other person? Sterling Johnson? Sterling Johnson. S-T-E-R-L. S-T-E-R-L. grad student yesterday who's in Brad Mon's lab who's interested in Alzheimer's oh. stuff called Alyssa Stasenko. No, Alyssa Stasenko. Someone Stasenko. Okay. Uh, I, you, 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 I think you would find her interesting. She, she's looking for, she wants to do kind of, um, uh, kind of neuropsychology. Oh. Uh, kind of, really? Yeah, semantic memory yeah. testing and stuff like this. So all my PhD and the postdoctoral. Oh, okay. I should definitely put you guys yeah. in touch. Would, would, would you, if I sent an email by putting you guys in touch? Actually, if you like to play the part of the oh. Ah, okay. I will, okay. okay. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. That would be awesome. tables this way so my head wouldn't be completely uh, in the way, only partially. Turned off the main light because it still flickers horribly. You go, yeah. Am I right in thinking that sitting underneath this, it's going to start flickering in a minute? I wonder if it flickers. It's a lot brighter. I think it's easier to see. When yeah, it's yeah, you don't really yeah. need this stuff anyway, right? No, this is. Okay. Quiet.
Well, how are you? I think, I don't know, I have no right whatsoever to raise the information for this, but I think they're going to be fine. What the hell do I know? I think they would be taking a chance if they gave the funding. Because I don't have a completely fleshed out proposal for what they... I don't know, I, I, I have no idea, but when are you going to find out? <laughs> like, probably like the end of this week. Yeah, they said within two weeks. Well, good luck with it. Thanks. And then, like, I also I didn't even do the homework this uh, yeah. past week because uh, my paper oh, got uh, yeah, rejected yeah. from uh, another journal. Yeah. So I have to completely, completely revise it. They wanted it to be like twice the length. You know what? Sometimes if they ask for that, they just change the school the idea. Wait, they reject it completely? They completely reject it. And like, I know who. Oh, so in that case, just send me some You don't need to make a lot of changes. Unless they really make it. I mean, like, I wrote it as a short report for Psych Science, like, oh, first, okay. which is like 2,000 words, mm -hmm. and then so I just... have a ton of stuff that you already cut out. You just yeah, I think you can just, like, put it back in, because oh, okay. um, they really want, like, because they did it on human nesting behavior, oh, okay. um, and they wanted more, like, comparative, like, studies of, like, like, animals. Okay, and I, undelete. This is pretty much what it is. Oh, okay. I have to go through and add it, but it's okay. still a big pain. Yeah. It took me... Like eight months to write this, no, and it took me like a year and a half plus to collect yeah. all the data. Yeah. So, you'll, you'll get a publisher. I mean, getting into psych yeah. science is, is very hard to get some yeah. psych science. Yeah. Good, I mean, good thing to aim for. Yeah. But they reviewed it? They reviewed it. It was like oh, really good. fast around for that. And okay. then it was, but, uh, I'm like, I know the people. The very small people. Even, they don't review everything in psych science. Yeah. So the fact that they reviewed it at all is good. Yeah. yeah. You know. And it's very, it's the, I'm the first person to show that. Um, well, except we just found out like a month and a half ago, a paper came out from McGill on the same thing that I did. Uh, except a little bit different. It's um, That's right. It doesn't yeah. that actually shows that you were doing a you know, good thing. I mean, it's annoying, but it's actually yeah. kind of validated. Well, yeah, they did a little bit different. Like, they did nesting in pregnant women, and they're doing nesting in ovulating women. So it's a little bit different, and no one's like thought of this concept nesting. You just like hear about it, like, oh, pregnant women, they nest. What does that mean? Okay. But no one really looks at it, so I was looking at it. But yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Is this level of light in here okay? The reason why I turned off the main lights is because they're still flickering in a kind of nasty, headache-inducing, epileptic, fit-inducing sort of way. So, but if it's too dark, it's probably light enough if you want to light the lights or something. But, uh, um, so, uh, okay, so this week we're going to look in more detail at a uh, specific uh, decoding paper. And uh, um, this is a very influential paper and it's good to, to know about. And I think, it, I think it illustrates quite a lot of 
principles that will apply more generally. And I think it's also just interesting, not just from a decoding point of view, but also from a neuroscience point of view. So, uh, so this is really trying to look at whether you can find out anything at a scale that's a little bit different from the standard scale of maps. But let's talk a little bit first about, about maps. So there's going to be kind of two aspects. This one is just to talk in broader conceptual terms about what they actually, what Kamatani and Tony actually did and why this was a question worth asking, what the context was in which it made sense. And then the other part is to kind of look at uh, a specific simulation in MATLAB of their results and kind of explore that a little bit more and, and look a little bit the mechanics of how one way of doing decoding would work. Uh, so that will, that will probably, I think, it's, I think it's kind of getting to the time when it'll be, it'll be good to look in more detail at uh, the mechanics of decoding. So we may spend a little more time going over that. So that will probably spread over into the, the Thursday class as well. But, um, well, let's talk a little bit about this whole idea of maps and columns. So, uh, now, some of you have quite a lot of neuroscience background, some of you don't. And I, uh, so, and, and, and that's completely fine because there's no, you know, it, it, I really like it that there's a diverse group of people here. So, so am I right in thinking that, so who, who's seen like this kind of picture before? I figure it's like easier to ask who's who's seen it and who hasn't seen it because it feels like embarrassing to see you haven't seen it. Although it shouldn't be embarrassing. Okay. So some of you have seen this kind of picture. So so we we looked in uh, in an earlier uh, <coughs> class uh, the idea that there's literally a map a map of uh, a visual space in your brain. So remember, like we had this kind of um, rings and radial type patterns and and you get a distorted picture of it on the, the surface of the cortex. Do you guys remember that from a few, few sessions ago? So that's a kind of broad scale map of, uh, of space. So you've got lots and lots of space in the brain uh, devoted to the kind of central part of your visual field, the, uh, the foveal part that's called, um, and kind of a little bit less space devoted to peripheral, and there's a nice kind of smooth uh, mapping of space out there in the world to space in your brain. Uh, now, obviously, that map is not the end of the story because, you know, great. Now you have a representation of of the world in your brain that looks kind of a little bit like the world. But you know, there's not like a little. Remember, we said that well, you can't really have just a little man in your brain, a little person in your brain who's um, looking at that map, because then you just have a kind of infinite chain of uh, of kind of things looking at other things. So somehow it has to get broken down uh, into a structure within that map. And one of the, now no one really understands completely how that happens, uh, but we do understand some aspects of, of, of how it happens. In particular, there's all kinds of different features represented in maps in the cortex. Some of these maps, the ones in more peripheral areas, we have a kind of okayish understanding of. The ones in higher level areas, have a very limited understanding of, but some initial clues. So, uh, so this, so, so the Kamatan Ning Tong paper is looking at a fairly low-level map of different orientations. So, um, so what do I mean by uh, different orientations? So, again, this this will be basically will divide the kind of uh, people who have a background in neuroscience versus people who don't. Uh, so, who who's seeing this kind of picture and, uh, and, and, and those kind of like what's being shown here. So probably looks like, what, like seven or eight of you maybe? Okay. Who, who are, would anyone like to kind of volunteer to just sketch out in, in broad terms what's, what's going on, what's going on here? Yes. So it's suggested that uh, Orientation uh, is organized in columns okay. in gray matter. So this is uh, the the uh, arrow is representing an electrode penetration for mm -hmm. gray matter, mm -hmm. and it shows the different orientation of columns uh, of this stimuli. Exactly. Of the response to the exactly. stimuli. Yes. Exactly. So basically, 
So the, the, the cortex, which is the kind of, you know, where all the high level clever stuff happens in your brain, or where a lot of it happens, is this sheet, kind of wrinkled sheet wrapped around your brain. That's the kind of wrinkly thing that you see. And, uh, and if in a, in, in a cat or a monkey or a rat, something like that, you can actually stick electrodes in there. And it turns out that if you stick an electrode going kind of perpendicular to the surface of the sheet, so basically straight into the sheet like that, you get basically the same types of responses you get basically the same types of responses all the way down. Um, so, so these little lines here represent the orientation that uh, the, the, the particular cells here are sensitive to. So this, literally, this is a picture of the stimulus that is very good at driving those cells. Um, and Hubel and Wiesel were the people during the 60s and, and 70s who discovered all of this stuff, and they, they subsequently won a Nobel Prize for it. And uh, David Hubel actually died just a, a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, did any of you see like, his obituaries in the paper or anything like that? Anyway, he died just quite recently. And uh, it turns out that for a long time, people were trying to figure out what the sensitivities were of, of cells in primary visual cortex. And they were doing things like kind of shining dots of light and trying to map out you know, where's the best place to shine the dot of light. and they weren't really getting anything. And the story, which I presume is a true story, although sometimes these stories you never know because they're kind of so cute. But the story is that they, so they would actually, you know, this was before computer monitors or anything. So they would actually use like a slide and a slide projector to show different stimuli. And, uh, and uh, the cell is uh, kind of hooked up to an electrode, which is hooked up to a loudspeaker. So you can hear kind of click, click, click every time it fires. And the story is that one day, Hubel and Wiesel were just kind of, you know, like everyone else, failing to get much response, and the slide fell through its slide holder, and suddenly the cell went crazy. So, and they were like, wait, what, what happened? So basically, there was the edges of the slide were moving rapidly through the field, receptive field of the cell. Receptive field just means the part of visual space where stuff that happens would make the cell fire. Okay, so, um, and, uh, and they were like, oh, OK, it isn't a dot after all. The best way to, uh, to stimulate these things is using a, a moving edge. And, uh, and then you know, they basically discovered all the, many of the key features of visual cortex and won the Nobel Prize. So, uh, so don't, don't connect your slides too tightly to the slide holders. Is the... <laughs> Actually, uh, I went to talk by, by Hubel once, and uh, he said, uh, you know, the problem with, uh, problem with neuroscientists these days is they're too much driven by a particular theory. They should just go out there and, you know, kind of see what's going on and, 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 and find things and not be too colored by, like, their prior expectations. And that was great in the 60s when, you know, everything was just kind of unexplored territory. That doesn't work as well now, but it worked pretty well for him. So, uh, so as well as there being particular... Um, uh, you know, a, a, a line, you know, finding the, a, a moving line of a particular orientation, a particular edge, stimulates the cells there, it turns out that different cells are responsive to different orientations, so the edge pointing in different directions. And so, so if you stick your electrode uh, kind of straight through the, 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 the cortex, top to bottom, perpendicular to the sheet, you tend to get the same um, the same orientation sensitivity each time, but if you stick it sideways uh, so that you're actually kind of moving through the, the sheet, then um, the ori I don't know if you can see this because this is kind of small, but there's um, slightly different orientation each time. Can you see? Is this visible at the back? There's like a kind of smoothly rotating line here. Okay, so, so this is the idea of a cortical column that uh, Within this column, literally this kind of vertical stack of cells, everything has more or less the same sensitivity, um, but across columns things vary. And so this is from a review paper by Vernon Mountcastle. He's generally considered to be the person who kind of discovered cortical columns. Um, so the different parts of the brain have different columnar structure, and as you get to higher level areas, our understanding gets less and less, primarily because there's just more and more different types of things 
that the cells can respond to. And so it's very, very, very difficult to actually kind of map the entire space of possibilities. So if the entire space is, uh, you know, just which orientation is this part of the brain most sensitive to, then you can say, okay, I can try all the different orientations. Uh, but once you say are sensitive to things like form or different shapes, you know, what's the space of possible shapes? Well, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of possible shapes. So uh, in some areas, that's not as much of a problem. So here's a, here's a study of motion. And uh, in this time, instead of, um, I don't know if you can see, these are actually little arrows instead of little lines. So this time, instead of being um, sensitive to just an orientation, it's movement in a particular direction. So to a V1 cell, V1 meaning primary visual cortex, to a V1 cell, you can just kind of wiggle the edge up and down like this. And you know, if it's moving this way or moving this way, the cell will still fire because what matters is the, the orientation of the edge. But in a motion sensitive area like MT, um, then uh, if it moves this way, it might make the cell fire. If it moves with, this way, it might not make the cell fire. But again, there's a kind of continuous, continuous ish mapping from column to column of, uh, of these features. But then, if you go, if you look in a high level area such as inferior temporal cortex, and which is, seems to be sensitive to things like faces, these are some monkey faces here, or things like certain types of corners or shaded shapes, then uh, this is work by this guy called Keiji Tanaka. Uh, you can find some kind of continuity, maybe. Like, you know, this part seems to be a bunch of face types, sensitive columns in a row. This seems to be a bunch of uh, kind of shading type columns in a row. But this is, you know, it's, it's basically impossible to explore the entire space of shapes. So, uh, so in the, in, the, in the more peripheral areas, the more lower level visual areas, we have more of an idea what's going on. But uh, I think, I think in one of the earlier classes I said, if you think that, um, if you think that there seems to be some kind of basic thing that's maybe being overlooked, do not be shy about saying it. You do not think, oh, it's absolutely impossible that you know, people would have overlooked this basic thing. I don't want to embarrass myself by saying anything about that. Because no, things do get overlooked. Okay? Or at least things don't necessarily get looked at straight away. So, uh, so here's, here, here's, here's a picture saying, aha, we figured out what's going on in primary visual cortex. We've got sensitivity to edges of different shapes. Now, can, can anyone think of anything, any aspect of vision that may not necessarily be captured just by uh, even low-level vision that may not necessarily be captured just by you know, a bunch of edges of different orientations? Color? Yes, yes. Who, said, who said color? Whoever said color? Excellent answer. OK, thank you. <laughs> Molly, right? Yes. OK, good. I, I just saw like a wiggling finger, and I wasn't sure. OK, uh, yes. So, um, so believe it or not, people didn't really look at color in visual cortex until uh, the early 80s. Actually, it was uh, then, I think she was a student of Hubel's, Mar Margaret Livingston. Uh, Livingston and Hubel discovered, uh, explored color, and again, made very, very important discoveries. No one had really looked at color properly. And it wasn't as if people were just twiddling their thumbs. They were like, OK, let's figure out all, all kinds of features of the way in which orientations and orientations of different spatial frequencies, meaning kind of different blurriness, are represented. But when they looked at color, all kind, they found all kinds of new stuff. So um, I wouldn't be in the tiniest bit surprised if sometime in the 70s there were some students sitting in a room th you know, listening to this stuff about orientations thinking, no one's really talking about color, but I don't want to say anything because uh, you know that'll make me look stupid. But no, so so th this is this is a general feature of uh, any investigation of the brain. There's lots and lots and lots of stuff that we don't understand. So if you if you think hmm, that doesn't seem quite right, you're probably onto something. So anyway, so this is this is the structure of maps and columns in cortex, or this is a kind of simplified structure. Uh, so, here, so this is a nice idea that there's a kind of continuous smooth mapping of orientation across this kind of two-dimensional cortical sheet. Now, uh, if you think about it, well, this is a little. There's no. This is a little bit of a kind of technical question, but if you were to try and map 
orientation completely smoothly to a 2D cortical sheet, it turns out that you can't do it. Because okay, if you think about it, um, uh, orientation, the shape of, you know, structure of orientation, it's kind of a one-dimensional thing, but it sort of loops around on itself. There's like a circle of orientations, right? Okay. So if you want to say, I want to have a perfectly smooth mapping of this loop, one-dimensional loop of things onto a two-dimensional sheet, where you might say, okay, fine, I'm going to have, like, you know, I'm going to say, draw a circle in the cortex on each each part of that will have one of these. But then you say, well, if it's really smooth, I can make that circle kind of tighter and tighter, and it still has got to be smooth. And you can imagine, well, if I make it tight enough, there's going to be a little, I've got a, you know, a zero size circle that's allegedly continuous. It's not going to work. That's just a kind of technical point. But it turns out it isn't actually com completely continuous mapping. Okay? And it would actually be impossible for it to be a completely uh, continuous mapping. So. Uh, oh, here's another picture that kind of illustrates that. Um, so here's a different, different orientation, uh, different uh, penetration through cortex. Here you can actually see one of the reasons why you quite often tend not to go straight in perpendicularly because the brain is all kind of curvy and foldy. So you know if you're sticking in from the outside here, <coughs> if you happen to stick in here, you're going to go more or less perpendicular. If you happen to be over, over a little bit, then you're going to be going in through cortex at a kind of angle. And uh, as you trace down different positions at the end of the electrode, you get this kind of smooth map. But it's not actually that smooth after all. So it turns out that the maps look kind of like this. So I'm going to talk you through a little bit So what's going on here. So first of all, this is kind of a pretty picture. Uh, so this was made uh, by a guy called Larry, Gary Blasdell, and other people have found similar maps um, using a technique called optical imaging. And this is where you uh, literally kind of take a little bit, like a little window off the, the surface of the, you know, cut a little hole in the skull, and take a little window off the brain. So you're literally looking at the brain. And uh, you can use, well, there's different ways of doing it, but a, a, a standard way of doing it is people have developed uh, colored dyes that are, um, are voltage sensitive. So remember how what's really going on here is that different neurons uh, um, becoming electrically active, so they're changing the uh, the voltage across the membrane of the cell, and through the magic of some kind of clever chemistry, people came up with dyes that change the color depending upon the voltage that, that's uh, in that the place where the dye is. So you can show a particular orientation to I think this was the cat, and. Uh, all of the parts of the cortex which are kind of in your window will become uh, more uh, active in response to that orientation, so their voltage will change, so the dye will change color. And you can take a picture of that, and then you can change your orientation a little bit and take a picture of that, and then you can kind of combine these maps together and turn it into a kind of nice color map. So each different orientation is represented by a different color. So the, the cortex doesn't actually kind of light up in these rainbow colors, just like it doesn't actually light up in kind of, you know, different shades of orange and yellow and left and right. This is a representation of the kind of peak change of, of voltage for each of these different orientations. So the places that are most sensitive to this orientation get colored in purple, and the ones that are most sensitive to this orientation get colored in blue, etc., etc. So, so, So what you can see is that there's actually there's, in many places, is you know fairly continuous. So, you know, if I kind of imagine I'm a, you know I have an electrode and I'm kind of going across here, then I've got you know red, yellow, green, blue, purple, back to red again, fairly continuous in this stretch. Okay. But there's some spots, uh, look here, where you've got these little kind of tight swirls and clusters, and I could have a little dot here where I basically got all the different orientations all around me. This is, they call this a pinwheel because it's basically like you know the, the middle of a, a little kind of tight wheel. And but this is the kind of discontinuity that you're inevitably going to get if you try and map this kind of smooth thing onto a 2D surface. And so there's actually this kind of you know, beautiful looking kind of multi-structured uh, map of orientations across uh, primary visual cortex. And a lot of people spend a lot of time studying the kind of properties of these kinds of maps. All kinds of interesting things happen with respect to the distribution of the pinwheels and all kinds of things, how this relates to ocular dominance columns. But one thing to notice here 
Okay, this, this, this bar here, this is a scale bar. This is, I don't know if you can see this because it's kind of near the bottom of the screen. This is one millimeter. Okay, so these are small, 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 fine grained things. So, you know, within a space of a single millimeter, uh, you might have many, many different orientation sensitivities. And this is kind of a problem for fMRI because even with our best fMRI uh, scanner, so here's just a kind of cartoon version of how big a typical voxel might look on top of this. So a good, you know, nice high resolution voxel would be kind of about three millimeters uh, across. So, um, so there's a lot of different stuff going on inside that voxel. Okay? So if you wanted to say, I would like to use fMRI to figure out which orientation someone is looking at, you might say, well, good luck with that, because within a single voxel, there are dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of orientations all, all present, and you know, you're not really going to get too much luck from that. So, so people thought, okay, what we need is higher resolution, what we need is you know, bigger and better scanner. Higher resolution would, of course, help. But it turns out, and I think this is another thing which, uh, another example where what seems like an obvious conclusion turns out not to be quite as right and not to be quite as obvious at all because a different possibility is just kind of overlooked. So you might say, what's the solution for looking at orientations? Oh, well, obviously, we need a more powerful scanner so that we have smaller voxels, so our smaller voxels can be closer to this kind of spatial scale, and then we might be okay. Obviously, that's it. Well, not necessarily. So it was very smart of uh, Kamatani and Tong to figure out a different way of approaching it. And uh, so, they, so they asked this question. I mean, it's kind of a daring question. Uh, can we decode which orientation someone is looking at? And it turned out that they could, but not by having tiny, 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 tiny voxels. So, so this is that picture from that paper. And this is not actually a very uh, clear picture. So in fact, one of the responses that I got, and you know, you haven't sent them in yet, which is totally fine, because I said for the end of the week. But, uh, but one of the responses very helpfully, I think a couple of them actually, very helpfully said, yeah, this pic you know, I asked this question, was there anything which wasn't very clear? And a couple of them said, yeah, this picture wasn't very clear. And I, I, I can totally understand why you would say that. It's not very clear. So I'm going to try and, try and kind of unpack a little bit what's going on here. And, and then we're going to, partly in this class and continuing in the next class, really go through in more detail um, what's going on here. By, by exploring it in MATLAB. And uh, that, that kind of more detailed look at the kind of mechanics of it is something that we haven't done a great deal of so far. It's been more kind of higher level conceptual stuff. So I think it probably would be useful to, to go into that. But, uh, but it's quite likely that some aspects of that may be a little confusing or a little unfamiliar. So please, please uh, you know, speak up, because it, it, if you find it confusing, almost certainly half the other people in the room do too, so do not be shy about saying that. Uh, so this is kind of a confusing picture, but I'm going to unpack a little bit what's going on here. Um, but this, this, is, this paper, when it came out, uh, it was actually another paper by Haynes uh, and Haynes and Reese, uh, in the same issue of Nature Neuroscience. Nature Neuroscience is kind of the, pretty much the top, one of the top neuroscience journals, so it's kind of, you know, your papers in there are like big deals. Um, and uh, we're doing a very similar thing. And uh, a commentary, a news and views piece came out by Jeff Winter, which actually does a much better job of explaining what's going on than the pictures in the original papers themselves. Uh, so, um, so actually, I, I, let me skip to that, and then I, I'm going to show you. We'll go back and try and kind of unpick a little bit, uh, unpack a little bit what's going on in that less clear picture. And, and these pictures here are the ones which are going to be kind of recreated by the, the MATLAB script. So the MATLAB script was very much inspired by Jeffrey Boynton's News and Views piece. Thank you, Jeffrey Boynton. Uh, so, so, recall, so here's, here's a kind of, here's a picture of these fine scale maps. And this kind of big coarse grid sitting on top of it is uh, a kind of schematic of um, how big a voxel would be. Now, this is just a simulation, okay? So these are not exactly to scale. In fact, actually, this was really to scale 
these little blobs here would be even smaller, probably, and you know the voxels wouldn't actually lie perfectly cleanly on it in a kind of nice grid. They would be all a bit distorted because of curvature in the cortex and things like that. But here's a kind of simplification, but it's a helpful simplification. So if you say, okay, I've got this kind of interesting looking, swirly-whirly, irregular map, and I'm just going to stick this big coarse grid on top of it and kind of sample it in this coarse manner, and basically just each voxel is going to just kind of say, well, what's the average of stuff that I've got going on inside me? And whatever that average is, that's the kind of big lumpy thing you're going to measure, and you, you don't get to find out what the subparts of it are. So, so if you say, okay, well, what on average is going to be the response to uh, within each one of these uh, voxels? Now, if this was a completely, completely regular pattern, then and and the grid kind of matched perfectly with that regular pattern, then every single voxel would have exactly the same stuff in it as every single other voxel, and none of these would end up looking any different from each other. And then we'd be kind of stuck because they would all just say, yep, I'm uniformly responsive to all the different orientations, yep, so am I. And they would all look the same. But as luck would have it, things are not that regular. And in fact, you know, it would be kind of difficult for them to be that regular given that this is this kind of big swirly-whirly thing and you're just kind of sticking a, uh, a rectangular grid on top of it. So, so if you say, okay, let's kind of, let's look at, the irregularities, this is a hypothesis as to what might be driving the success of the Kamatanian Tong approach, which we're going to kind of explore in a lot of detail over the rest of this class and then the next class. So, so let's, let's have a look at what's going on inside these a little bit. So is it the case that there's all the different orientations are kind of uniformly represented between, say, this guy here, this, this voxel here? Well, not really. If you kind of just eyeball it a bit, this is like mouse showing up a bit? Yeah, okay. Um, if you eyeball it a bit, well, there seems to be quite a lot of the green stuff here, which I guess is like maybe this orientation is kind of, you know, 45 degrees orientation. This, vox this voxel, just by the kind of irregularity of the underlying orientation map, seems to have a little bit more green stuff in it, uh, and um, maybe a little bit less of the, of the red stuff. And so this here is a histogram of the, uh, the kind of amount of orientation stuff that's within this, this voxel, and that kind of quantifies, yep, there's more green stuff, there's more green stuff here, which corresponds to these, these orientations and a bit less of the blue stuff, which corresponds to these orientations. So in general, if I show this orientation to that particular voxel, it's going to make that voxel more active than if I show this orientation, just in virtue of the fact that there's a kind of very much finer scale but irregular map that this voxel happens to be sampling a big coarse chunk of. Does that make sense, more or less? Yeah, question. But the uh, the voxels are three dimensional though, and we're only seeing the surface of it. So the voxel is three millimeters. A lot of gray matter is only one millimeter, so that would include the whole depth of the gray matter. That's a very very good. So this point. would have to be exactly orthogonal to the surface. That's a very very good point. So this is a complete oversimplification. But it turns out, okay, so imagine now if instead of, instead of this grid happening to be lined up, like perfectly lying in the surface, it was kind of going through the surface at a funny angle, okay, which it almost certainly would be. Not to mention the fact that there's all kinds of folds. <laughs> the only thing that matters here for, in order for, that's a very, very good point. The only thing that matters in order for each of these voxels to end up with a slightly different response is just that they don't all sample exactly the same set of orientations. So even if, you know, this voxel, I mean, this voxel seems to have kind of like some extra red stuff in it, okay? But suppose this voxel was partly in the surface of cortex and partly kind of sticking out the edge and, you know, getting some white matter and getting some kind of dura, which it almost certainly would be. That's fine because all that matters is that it doesn't end up sampling exactly the same stuff as this voxel, which is probably kind of sticking out of some other bit, okay? So the thing that's really driving this is the non-uniformity of these different voxels. Because the, the idea here is basically, I, I can't look inside any of these voxels, but some of them, just because they have this kind of uneven, uneven sampling, 
are going to be a little bit more uh, preferential to one orientation or a little bit more active to a different orientation. And this, or this guy here might have a slightly different preference from this guy here. So although I can't actually say, you know, suppose I want, so, so you can, okay, so, so suppose you just have the question of, do, is there a little, is there, do we think that, suppose I've only got, say, this voxel and this voxel, and this voxel here tends to like the green stuff more, and this voxel here tends to like the red stuff more, okay? And suppose your only question is, do I think on our, and the, you know, the green stuff is, I guess, an orientation kind of like this, and the red stuff is a more kind of horizontal orientation, according to this key here. So suppose your only question is, do I think the person was looking at this more horizontal orientation color-coded by red, or this more kind of oblique orientation colored by green, and you only had these two voxels, okay? Then, if you've got more activation in this one than this one, then you say, yep, I guess he seems to, you know, the, person, the subject seems to be looking more at the red stuff. But I just would like to emphasize red stuff does not mean they were looking at a red color, it means they're looking at an orientation that's color-coded like this. And um, if you get a little bit more activation in this one, then you would say, okay, I think that maybe there's more of this kind of green color-coded orientation going on there. So even if, you know, as well as there being some red stuff, there's just a whole bunch of junk from, you know, like white matter or cerebrospinal fluid or you name it in here too, as long as this voxel tends to respond more to the red colored orientations and this voxel tends to respond more to the green colored orientations, then looking at differential activation between this voxel and that voxel gives you a little bit of information about one orientation being slightly more present than the other. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but of course, individual voxels are horrendously noisy and you, know, you can't tell really anything from looking at individual voxels. But if you have lots and lots and lots of voxels, and each of them has like a little bit of an extra preference one way, a little bit of an extra preference another way, then if you aggregate the information across all of them, then together you can actually get a decent, a decent guess as to what the orientation might be. So this is basically the kind of entire idea behind, um, behind uh, multivoxel pattern analysis, and in fact behind kind of a lot of classifiers in general, that you have <coughs> lots and lots of very slightly informative things which collectively, if you kind of treat them the right way, end up being quite informative. Uh, so what, what's like an example of that? Um, it's actually not really that different from any type of sampling of lots of different things. If someone commits a, I mean it's not exactly the same thing, but it, it's quite related in this sense of kind of pooling lots of somewhat unreliable information. So, you know, say there's an election coming up, and you know, Gallup does a phone poll, and they call up a thousand people and say, you know, who do you want to vote for, Republican or Democrat? Well, if you do a mini version of that poll, and you say, well, I walked along the street, and I stopped two people, and they both said they wanted to vote Republican, so I guess Republicans are going to win, you would say, well, that's not very good, because, you know, each individual person's response is really not that informative, right? For, for all kinds of reasons, partly because they might not be telling you the truth, also because, you know, who are these people that you managed to pick anyway? Maybe you were standing outside, you know, the headquarters of the local party when you actually, maybe you weren't really sampling random people, and two people, you know, what can you tell from two people? Okay? So, but if you, if you call up a thousand people and you try and make sure that they're all from all kinds of places and they're not all from, you know, the wealthier parts of town or all from the poorer parts of town or, or all from a university district, something like that. <clears throat> if you call up lots and lots of people, then even though each individual person is not very informative, collectively, you actually might get a pretty good estimate of what's going on. That's the whole idea behind sampling statistics in general. There's no extra special magic going on in something like a classifier, which might take in, so the input from a thousand voxels, and say, and uh, each individual voxel might be very noisy and unreliable, but collectively they can tell you something quite reliable. Now there is extra stuff going on in exactly, you know, what do you do with all of these voxels? You don't necessarily treat them all the same way. You might assign bigger weights to some of them, smaller weights to others of them. And then even after doing that weighting process, you might do other stuff. So it's not just a case of just averaging them all together like you might do in a poll. 
Um, and, that, and that's essentially the difference between um, <clears throat> looking at a pattern versus just, say, getting the total amount of average activation intensity. So the stuff you can find from the pattern that you won't necessarily just get from the plane averaging. But in terms of getting more information from a large number of individually kind of noisy things, it's really quite similar. So, um, so the basic idea here is that I've got lots and lots of voxels which individually are giving me a very, very imperfect picture of which orientation might be present, but luckily they're not all giving me exactly the same imperfect picture. You know, this guy, this, this voxel here, tends to be just a little bit more active, plus lots of noise for the green orientation, which are, you know, these ones. And let's see, what's another one that's kind of got a, a bit of a um, asymmetry going on? Yeah, this one has quite a lot more red. So there's some variability. So you're sampling a whole bunch of slightly different things and kind of pooling the information across them. And so the idea is, if you do that, then, then with pooling in enough information from enough different sources, which are all telling you a slightly different thing, then you can actually collectively get something somewhat more reliable out. So, so this, this, picture, this picture is a kind of nice cartoon of of the basic idea that might be driving the success. And there's a picture, there's a picture in the Kamatani and Tong paper, which is sort of a 1D version of this, which is much, much less clear than this one. Um, and you may have you may have looked at that, I think it's that figure five or something. You may have looked at that and thought, I have no idea what's going on here. So I, I personally find this commentary picture much clearer. This is the basis for the kind of MATLAB that we're going to look at in a while. But um, but I'm guessing that probably some aspects of this are not very clear. So feel more than, yes. I sort of have just a meta question. So yeah. none of this would work if it was not for the fact that, from what, for instance, Super and Wiesel found, was that there are these tuning preferences for different parts.